such chance. Today's keyword is COVID-19, disease, vaccine, integrative medicine. So let's share about it. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, first of all, let me tell a little bit about myself. Uh, I am a medical graduate from Shanghai uh, Medical University 40-some uh, years ago. And then I went to the United States for a PhD study in molecular biology, biochemistry back in the mid-1980s. And after that, I went to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland for clinical uh, oncology uh, uh, cancer study. And then uh, after that, I, you know, I worked at various positions, uh, including an Army, uh, a United States Army physician. I was a department chief uh, before I set up my own private practice, uh, a chain integrative health center in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, it's been almost 20 years now. Yeah. As I know, you have two special identities in the United States and China. Yeah, as you know, I'm a Chinese American and uh, I practice medicine in the United States. And back a couple of years ago, I also, I've been coming back to China also. I got, a, uh, I got again, my Chinese license and a special consultant to Shenzhen Medical Association and Shenzhen Baoyan Hospital. So I also consult for patients for hospitals, go to conferences. Yes, I, am I, I have an active medical license in, in both countries. Okay. You work in the United States. Why are you here now? Yeah, actually, I was uh, coming back, you know, every year I come back to spend my Chinese New Year with my parents. They are in their 80s. And uh, so this time I was coming back to attend conferences, spend time with my parents. And what I didn't know is that nearly about uh, 10, 20, I mean, 10 days, two weeks into it, uh, the COVID-19, now we know uh, it as COVID-19 broke out. And that's how I got involved in COVID-19. Because throughout the many years of my anti-aging research in my medical practice, I become very much involved in integrative medicine uh, uh, practice. In particular, vitamin C is one of the key nutrients that I found to, be, uh, to play a very important role. So I know about vitamin C. I know a lot about it. And part of the vitamin C's effects is, uh, in, is its uh, antiviral and its in, uh, role in the acute uh, infection treatment. And that's how one, you know, COVID-19 uh, broke out. And uh, we didn't have any specific, uh, we still don't have any specific antiviral drugs or we, don't have, we still don't have any vaccine against it. So I know vitamin C and other, for example, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, these integrative, integrative medicine measures are powerful and effective in preventing and treating these viral infections. That's how I got involved and I started calling for use in particular high dose vitamin C. About international VC medical support team. That's right, actually I'm not the only one actually, you know, there's a, quite a few people out there who understand vitamin C's effects. And uh, throughout my years in China, I also made uh, quite a few friends in the academia, in, in the public hospital system here. So I got together with these uh, uh, think alikes, and as, long, uh, as well as some international experts on vitamin C, we formed an international high-dose IVC medical support team. Uh, our, uh, this is an ad hoc team with one focus, which is to educate and to promote uh, educated people, particularly professionals and uh, people in the leadership positions about vitamin C. Vitamin C is very safe and it is effective and it's inexpensive. This is something we should use in COVID-19 treatment and prevention. What is ISOM? Yeah, actually, uh, we all know, many of you know about Light, uh, Dr. Linus Pauling, a two-time Nobel winner, right? So he actually w did a lot of vitamin C work and he really took vitamin C to a very high level. And uh, so Dr. Pauling had a, uh, a theory of so-called also molecular medicine. So basically also molecular medicine simply means that uh, uh, at the molecular level, our body, we are healthy 
it, it, the reason we're healthy is because we have the proper amount of each nutrition, and also these nutrients exist in proper relationship. And therefore, if we can figure out what's the amount and uh, what are the relationships, then we, are, we should be able to maintain our health and to treat the diseases. And this is what, what we call also molecular medicine. And so the International Society for Also Molecular Medicine, abbreviated as you mentioned, the ISOM, is a medical society of uh, decades of existence, uh, directly coming down from Dr. Linus Pauling. Many experts in this group, and they, are, uh, they know about a lot of vitamin C. Some of them uh, they, uh, they publish a lot of papers, whether in peer-reviewed scientific journals or in po uh, popular medical science reviewable or clinic clinicians like myself, we use it in our clinical practice. So these are the, this is a group of uh, doctors and scientists. Uh, and with, uh, of course, at the also molecular medicine, vitamin C is not the only one. You know, it's a broad range of uh, integrated medical approach. And uh, uh, so that's how ISOM got involved, because we share the common goal. In this year, the new virus coming, and called COVID-19 has keep increasing and kills a lot of people. So about the new virus, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, you know, uh, so this is very surprising because I came back and not to <laughs> expect this. And uh, so when COVID-19 broke out, as I mentioned, the way from this team start calling for high dose vitamin C at the use and uh, also uh, we published some papers. One of, uh, them, one of the papers I published in medicine in drug discovery called uh, Can Early and High Dose Intravenous uh, Vitamin C Treat or Prevent COVID-19? And uh, this article caught a wide range of uh, attention, and including that of uh, the NIH. And NIH invited me to give a guest speaker lecture on vitamin C, uh, which again, uh, is a fact-finding science-based uh, lecture and uh, to show the existing literature how vitamin C is effective against all sorts of uh, infections, in particular with respect to vitamin C. Let me briefly summarize that, is that uh, vitamin C has been shown to be able to prevent and treat many pneumonia patients and pneumonia due to var various types of viral, viral infections. And also vitamin C is able to reduce the severity of uh, uh, complications of pneumonia, for example, something we call ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a common key pathology to COVID-19. COVID-19 is scary because it spreads very fast. But not only that, because a proportion of these COVID-19 patients will develop uh, breathing trouble, what we call ARDS, and there was a very high mortality rate in anywhere from you know, 2 percent up and higher uh, of these people may die. And that's what makes it scary, uh, partially and mostly, right? So actually, the underlying mechanism is a a a ARDS. We know back 17 years ago, uh, SARS in China and the southeastern countries, and also eight years ago, MERS in Middle East and some European parts. They are all coronavirus uh, family, and they also have this common ARDS as its uh, uh, pathology. So ARDS is this type of uh, respiratory virus, common mechanism leading to severe disease and even uh, death. And so we know what what is behind the ARDS is what we call, now we understand as a cytokine storm. Or well, literally speaking, is a sudden burst of free radicals in our body. These free radicals will cause oxidizing damage to our normal cells. In this particular case, is our lung cells, causing us, uh, 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 our uh, ability to exchange oxygen uh, to be in trouble. And of course, other viruses will cause other type of problems. For example, virus can cause liver problems, or kidney problems, or GI problems. So actually, viral infections and other pathogens, or maybe toxins, 
they have something in common, is that which is uh, oftentimes what leads to more severe pathology is this significantly increased uh, oxidative stress or cytokine storm. Now, this is common. This is not unique to any particular virus or not particularly unique to COVID-19. And uh, so in scientific term or medical term, we oftentimes call it increased oxidative stress. So antioxidants naturally, logically, should have a major role in reducing these, the severity of diseases or maybe even preventing this type of diseases. And in fact, a lot of research exists in the, in the literature, which is what I presented. And by the way, the whole presenting is available online. You know, you can go through. I'm not going to give you the references here. But uh, uh, ARD, I mean, vitamin C, high dose uh, vitamin C is able to prevent pneumonia, is able to treat pneumonia. ARDS is able to reduce the severity of ARDS, reduce the mortality, as well as cut short of the hospital and ICU stay. So these are su uh, sufficient evidence exists in the literature to show that high dose vitamin C can have a role in treating these severe diseases. And that's important. When we heard the word virus, and then another word will appear is like vaccine. So yeah, vaccine, vaccine. yes, yeah. Okay, that's right, yeah. You know, we know vaccine. Vaccines are important. I wish we had a vaccine today. I wish we had a vaccine four months ago, right? So I wish everybody can get a dose or maybe a couple of doses of vaccine to stop this COVID-19 from spreading globally. We have to understand vaccine is only available, I mean, is only useful in preventing an epidemic or pandemic. Once somebody has already caught the disease, then, you know, vaccine is of no use. But the problem with vaccine is that we have to understand for any new epidemic, New, I mean, for example, this time COVID-19, 17 year, years ago SARS, eight years ago MERS. These are all brand new viruses. These viruses were not known to mankind. We didn't know about them, right? So to develop a vaccine, first of all, you have to have a pathogen, in this case is virus, that has to appear. That has to catch our attention. And that has to cause enough severe significance or damage so that we will devote our resources, scientists and money, to develop a vaccine. That's the nature of vaccine, right? So we need to study vac uh, viruses, and then we develop a, a vaccine against it. Then we have to put through the vaccine, uh, put the vaccine through clinical trials to show the vaccine is safe and also effective. Once that's proven, then we, should, then we have to mass produce vaccine. Worldwide, COVID-19 is a worldwide global pandemic. We have 7 billion people worldwide. So if you have to vaccinate the majority of them, we're talking about billions of doses of vaccine. And the con so, so best, anyway, so vaccine is a reaction to a newly appearing epidemic. And look at COVID-19. So COVID-19, from the day we know about it until today, it's merely only about four months, not even quite four months yet. Look at the damage. We have tens of thousands, maybe even more. Some reports show 150,000 people already died of COVID-19. And worldwide, we're still probably in the peak of it and not end yet. And also, the damage, the economic da damage because of the lockdown and all the other you know, people, job loss and everything, the economic damage has already surpassed the one trillion US dollars, which is huge. So the best uh, estimate that of when we can have a vaccine is probably still at least one year and uh, more likely year and a half or maybe two years out if we can get a vaccine at all. Now think about it, four months already into it, we already, I mean, the damage, lots of carnage, lots of financial losses. What happens if we have to lock down for another two years or one year? What kind of damage is this? This is important. It's because we can never predict a new virus from coming. Vaccines are excellent from preventing recurring episodes. 
for example, like a common code. Even in common code, it's controversial. But let's say for something that we already know, like a polio virus, right? So we, if we know it's coming back, we can get a vaccine to prevent it. But for some brand new virus that ha we didn't know nothing, uh, we didn't know it existed, we have to wait until it appears and develop vaccine. Therefore, by definition, any new viral infection, we will have a lot of damage. And there also, there are some very disturbing trends. Let me just run through a little bit. If you look on the website, look at the WHO Wikipedia website, you, you will notice that in the short 20 years of 21st century, we already have had about 60-some epidemics and pandemics. This, that's average three epidemics each year in 21st century. Now, if you review the past 200 years in the 19th and 20th century, there are close to 100 epidemics, probably 96-ish, uh, epidemics or pandemics. Think about it. In the last 20 years, we already had 60-some episodes of these pandemics, epidemics. In the whole 200 years before, we had only about 90-some. So this is pointing to a trend that apparently we begin to see more and more of these epidemics and pandemics showing up. This is very disturbing because I thought personal hygiene or economic status is related to these infectious diseases. But why are we seeing an increasing trend of these uh, uh, epidemics? And also, recently, there's a BBC article that shows something similar, which is actually the new viral epidemics is appearing more often than before. There appears to be four times new epidemics and the pandemics than before. We're talking about SARS, MERS, and COVID-19. And we also know some less known, probably, Zika virus, uh, Marburg virus, Ebola virus, uh, many other viruses out there. These are all new ones. They should first show, uh, appear. So on the one hand, we are seeing an increasing trend of these uh, new viral epidemics. On the other hand, we still don't have an active preventive and treatable measure. Every time when a new epidemic or pandemic shows up, we treat it as a brand new disease. And we have to wait for a long time until vaccine. Now, let me make it clear. There has never been a vaccine in the history, in the entire history. There has never been a vaccine that was developed, manufactured in a timely manner that we can employ it clinically to stop an ongoing first-time epidemic. Never. We didn't have a vaccine for SARS. We didn't have a vaccine for MERS. We didn't have a vaccine the first time for Marburg, Ebola, Zika, or COVID-19. And the COVID-19 virus is at least a year away, maybe longer. And like I mentioned, the disturbing trend is that every year we see about three epidemics in this century. This trend will not stop. And next time, there will be another epidemic or pandemic hitting us. What are we going to do? Are we going to say do the same thing like what we're doing today, panicking, causing a lot of carnage, a lot of uh, financial losses? And I'm appealing to all the leaders in all different walks of life, starting from political, business, industrial, medical, scientific leaders to our public. We need to think about this question seriously. Don't wait until it hits again, hits us again, because in a short period of time, it can cause catastrophic damage to mankind. We are all in this boat together, and we have to have more active, effective, safe measures to prevent and treat these new epidemics. And I believe the new way, I mean, th these active, more effective measures should be something that is effective and that is safe and that is readily available and hopefully that's also inexpensive. So whenever something new coming out, even without understanding much the nature of it, for example, a new virus coming up without a vaccine, then we are able to 
employ what we learned to clinical practice to prevent the, uh, f uh, the, the, the from catching the disease or to treat these diseases from getting uh, uh, progressing into more severe or even death. And that's what was something we do. And I believe we do have something hand, in, in, in handy right now, which is the vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, and other, you know, also molecular molecules or what we in integ integral medicine uh, practice we promote. Because these molecules and nutrients Ha we have a lot of uh, existing evidence to show they are effective in preventing and treating various type of uh, 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 viral infections or other bacterial infections as well. And they are available, they're inexpensive. And we don't have to wait until we characterize a new virus that we can apply that. Actually, today, worldwide, in COVID-19 prevention and treatment, we can use it today. And we can also use it in the future. And uh, this, all the scientific literature is out there. There's enough research. Let me, again, about vitamin C. I only talk mostly on vitamin C because I want to just highlight the existence of this, this type of research. But that research, abundant research exists for other, you know, uh, vitamin D, magnesium, and the others as well. Now, vitamin C, as uh, in my NIH present, I clearly presented it. Vitamin C uh, is very promising at, in preventing codes and in treating, preventing pneumonia, I already talked about, in treating and reducing the severity of ARDS and is, you know, the, uh, the, all the literature is av available online. And I hope we can realize this point. We don't have to wait, you know, on the one hand, we develop vaccine. At the same time, we have something we can use. And that's what I hope a message that we all can get across. For COVID-19, does VC really work on it? How? Well, that's important, yes. Like I said, you know, one of the problems in uh, the majority of physicians is that, is that we consider COVID-19 as a separate disease, and we have to start treating it differently. We have to develop a unique, special antiviral drug or drugs for COVID-19, or unique virus, I mean, a vaccine against COVID-19. But we miss, we, we, we ignore, we, didn't, we don't realize, actually a lot of these viruses show a lot of things in common. I think we already talked about these cytokine storm, increased oxidative stress, and uh, uh, underlying it. And vitamin C is not only a direct virus killing agent. Yes, vitamin C, one large dose vitamin C is taken uh, vitamin C will be oxidized in our body to produce hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a direct virus killing agent. Vitamin C also boosts our immunity. It, it has something what we call chemotaxis, basically that uh, helps uh, 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 the, the white blood cell or defense molecules or cells into these infected areas. And the vitamin C also immunomodulates our immune reaction and may be involved in gene regulation as well. Now, clinically, we have seen preliminary data that vitamin C is effective in treating COVID-19. You know, this we need evidence, uh, evidence-based medicine. So in Shanghai, you know, uh, first of all, back early in uh, February, this is over two months ago, Wuhan announced the first high-dose vitamin C clinical trial. And there were a total at least of three IVC trial, uh, trials for COVID-19 treatment. And also in Shanghai, we directly use high-dose vitamin C in the treatment. Let me give you some uh, data. And uh, as we reported uh, before on the social media, on YouTube, Facebook, and our writing at uh, our website, also at the ISOM website, we have uh, uh, all the written articles we'll refer you to. Well, basically in Shanghai, about a month ago, March 17th, we interviewed uh, uh, one of the senior experts on the Shanghai Expert Panel. We treated uh, about 50 cases of COVID-19 patients with high-dose vitamin C, with about 10 to 20 grams of vitamin C every day. And uh, these patients improved faster. They had a shorter hospital stay, a shorter, a shorter about five days. Average is about 30 days. These patients stayed about 
25 days or so. And no one in the vitamin C group died. Everybody survived. Of course, at that time, there was a total of 358 COVID-19 patients in Shanghai. There were three deaths. None of those three COVID-19, unfortunately, dead people uh, had a high dose vitamin C treatment. Okay. And one of the patients actually was receiving extra high dose. Basically, on top of the 10, 20 grams that he was receiving, he will also receive the 50 grams bolus over four hours. So he was receiving 60 or 70 grams in that day. And uh, because he was uh, deteriorating very rapidly, show, shown as the redu I mean lowering, reducing oxygen saturation. And uh, so uh, that's how he was treated. And when the vi vitamin C, 50 grams over four hours, was uh, going into his body, uh, the, Dr. Mao reported that you can see literally real-time improvement of oxygen uh, saturation. So basically, he was improving cl clinically quickly. So that's the Shanghai experience. And uh, uh, about a week ago, we had a video conference with Dr. Pen, Dr. Pen, Zhong Pen. He's now worldwide famous, you know. You know and he was the first, the world's first clinical trial of high dose vitamin C on COVID-19. And he reported to us that his group recruited more than 40 some patients. Unfortunately, the good news is that uh, the uh, COVID-19 is on the decline in China. And uh, so that's good news. But the bad news is that he doesn't have any new patients, <laughs> you know. So his study, uh, he, has, he has to modify the, the design because he didn't have enough patients. So anyway, out of the over 40 patients he, uh, he, he treated, uh, so you can see clearly that uh, the patients, uh, oh, by the way, he was using 24 grams a day, uh, which is a little bit higher than the Shanghai group. And uh, so he literally see a significant reduction in inflammatory markers, basically in, in free radicals we're talking about. And also these patients uh, also improved significantly faster and uh, the hospital and ospi uh, IT, ICU stay as well as the mortality stay, uh, reduction uh, was also reduced. Uh, of course, the final uh, data is being analyzed. You know, we have to analyze statistically, may, make sure it's uh, statistically significant or these others. But anyway, this is the preliminary result. And uh, also very importantly, that uh, these patients were receiving high dose IV IVC was also showing improved organ function including liver function, renal function, or these vital life function, okay? And so, so the Shanghai group experience and the uh, Wuhan group experience were all both promising, although these are primary data showing that high dose vitamin C is effective. By the way, these groups didn't have any other treatments except the vitamin C and the supportive care, including like a, a heparin type of anticoagulation. And also one other very important point I want to for, uh, point out is that actually in Wuhan, uh, they apparently they recognize the importance. So the majority, uh, the major hospitals in Wuhan, the healthcare providers were all receiving vitamin C powder. They were instructed to, re to take a vitamin C oral powder every day, a couple of grams a day. I thought that was uh, very interesting because mm -hmm. as far as I know, this is probably the, the government level, hospital level of uh, preventive measure of using vitamin C. And I hope there will be some studies to show, I mean, I hope they are underlying uh, doing that. Actually, we have a survey we'll talk about later, you know, see if these uh, people who take these vitamin Cs will have a lower uh, uh, risk of catching the COVID-19, or if they do, maybe the severity will be reduced. Uh, we, we don't know yet, but uh, I'm hoping that uh, we will have the, some data. But uh, uh, also, I want to say uh, another, you know, first in China uh, worldwide is that both the Shanghai government and the Guangdong province government, these are two major uh, regional governments in China. They made it a public uh, uh, official statement. Basically, they published the expert consensus of COVID-19 treatment guideline. And high dose vitamin C is included in both Shanghai and Guangdong province government policies. Now these are, again, words first. Why are these important? It's because 
although the COVID-19 pandemic in China is on the declining, of course, you know, we have to be sure it's, it's under, still under control. It doesn't relapse. However, worldwide, I receive on a daily basis emails, requests for help. Unfortunately, I'm not able to re respond to all these emails because it's due to the sheer volume, that's too much. And, uh, but we, I receive emails from worldwide, from Northern Europe, Central Western Europe, Southern Europe, to Africa, Middle East, uh, Asia, New Zealand, Australia, United States, Japan, and uh, South America, and asking for help. How can we basically ask us how we can help the local governments, local doctors to adapt, to use the high dose vitamin C. And actually this is one of the purposes of uh, this video, is that I'm showing you all the evidence, not only on this video, but also on the links to the various websites and the social media, the existing scientific evidence and preliminary data. I, I might also add, from the United States right now, and after roughly about a couple of weeks now, maybe a month or two, uh, because the United States now it's uh, reaching the peak of uh, COVID-19, actually the main media begins to rep report positive uh, cases. Recently there's a LA Los Angeles Times, which, which is one of the major newspapers in, in the United States, reports a, reported a, a positive case of uh, a patient's uh, recovering from uh, COVID-19 with high dose IVC. And also new US News. I think US News may be the most circulated uh, uh, media in the United States. Reported a, a doctor in Richmond, Virginia. He was so sick with this uh, COVID-19. And his another doctor friend was treating him, believed in high dose, lucky for him, using high dose vitamin C. And uh, the doctor, treating doctor said, I've never seen anybody re re recovering so fast. This is all reported in the news, news media. Yeah. So, and also in clinicaltrials.gov, we all know this is the official registry worldwide, the largest uh, of uh, all these clinical trials. These are formal scientific studies up to, to two days ago. Now there are 12 clinical trials registered at the clinicaltrials.gov relating specifically to high dose vitamin C and COVID-19 treatment. Altogether, there are more than 300 clinical trials with I vitamin C involved. So don't tell me there's not enough research on vitamin C. And let me also tell you, in pubmed.gov or pubmed.com, which is the largest medical library worldwide, there are over 65,000 scientific articles published in the journal, not including newspaper articles or blogs or these others. These are pure reviewed journal articles, scientific articles, more than 65,000. I am not aware of any other molecule that has that many research papers published. Vitamin C is one of the few, if not the most studied, is one of the few molecules that has received most studies. So don't, again, don't tell me we need more research. Yes, we always need more research. I'm telling you, there exists enough evidence, both from the clinical research, I mean basic research, to clinical ex, uh, research showing vitamin C's effectiveness. And actually some of these resu results are summarized in a couple of books. Now let me introduce particularly three books. One is, the, the most relevant here is uh, a book called uh, Primal Panacea, which I also uh, written by a famous uh, uh, worldwide expert on vitamin C, Dr. Thomas Levy, a board certified uh, cardiologist in the United States, and he's also an active uh, member of the, uh, his uh, 2016 Hall of Fame winner of the International Society for Also Molecular Medicine. Um, he's great in vitamin C and others. And also, uh, this primary Palatia we also uh, edited and published in China. Uh, I, I, I was uh, in, in responsible for that. I edited and translated that book. And so it's available in China too. Now this book has quoted hundreds, I think it was like 1,200 references, scientific references. This is one of the major review books summarizing vitamin C's research in both basic to clinical trials and studies or case reports showing vitamin C has been used uh, in nearly all, if not all, most of the 
uh, different infections. Let me give you a few. Poliovirus, uh, hepatitis, viral encephalitis, and uh, uh, you know, bacteria, uh, also bacteria, for example, TB, tetanus, rabies, what common codes, what you can think is all included. So this is one of the starting books, if you're interested in vitamin C, read about it. Primal Panacea, or in Chinese, Wan Ying Ling Dan. They're both available on Amazon.com. So this, actually this book mo focused mostly on, on, vitamin, uh, on the antiviral, uh, antimicrobial. So here's the conclusion. Vitamin C is a universal antimicrobial agent. It has the ability to, an to be antivirus, antibacterial, and other pathogens. Or why is it universal? It's, not, it's, it's not targeting any specific virus because it's targeting the common thing. Why? One simple thing I already mentioned too is that because the oxidation of vitamin C produces hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, we all know, is a household name that's, uh, that kills anything, right? Now, the key here we have to understand is that hydrogen peroxide is safe for all human beings, for normal cells. Why? Because our normal cells have what we call catalase system. A catalase system is which is able to degrade the hydrogen peroxide. So when, you know, when our normal cells, when, when hydrogen peroxide is into our normal cells, we are able to degrade, to deactivate hydrogen peroxide. So our normal cells will not be negatively affected by hydrogen peroxide. However, virus, bacteria, and, and the cancer cells don't have that ability. That's key here. So that's one book. Another book of the, by the same author, Dr. Thomas Levy, and also I translate published in the Chinese, available on Amazon, as, as well as in mainland China, is called uh, Death by Calcium. In Chinese, it's Ying Xing Sasso Bu Gai Qi. Now, this book primarily focuses on the chronic disease, primarily on osteoporosis, and also the related uh, astro, uh, the atherosclerosis. Actually, these diseases are related, believe it or not. So we're not going to talk too much about it, but it, this is also something, you know, vitamin C has a lot of effects. Other than the acute infection, there are other chronic disease uh, implications. Actually, that's more I'm interested in, in, in general, uh, in, in peaceful times, not at this war time right now. And so we can talk about uh, more in the future. A third very good book is by Dr. Uh, Chi, Dr. Chen Chi. She's a professor of pharmacology at uh, Kansas Medical University uh, uh, Department of Pharmacology. And uh, the title of the book is called uh, Vaccine, I mean, uh, uh, Vitamin C and Cancer. She has done a lot of research. Her work is often quoted uh, in the, uh, in the uh, clinical trials. She's involved in many medical, medical clinical trials. So that's a great book, particularly in the area of vitamin C uh, in the application of cancer. Yes, I use high dose vitamin C in cancer treatment as well. So those three books will be a good start for vitamin C if you're interested in. Okay. I heard that you volunteered to go to Wuhan during the yes, you know, I did. Uh, yeah. yeah, the virus. So, why did you make a decision, and did you feel like afraid of it? <laughs> oh, well, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. Yes, I'm afraid of death. Life is good. I'm very interested in anti-aging. Why? Because I, life is good. I want to live longer, happier, and healthier. That's what I'm interested in. I want to do it myself. I hopefully I can help my parents, they are in their 80s, to achieve the same goals. And also I want to help my family members, loved ones, and my patients to do the same. And that's why I'm particularly interested in anti-aging and integral medicine. Now, why did I volunteer? When I volunteered to go to Wuhan, the epicenter of this play, uh, of COVID-19, is because, well, let me tell you, I received a lot of research. I was receiving daily phone calls from my family in the United States. To be honest with you, I didn't tell my parents because I didn't want to scare them. <laughs> I didn't. And I don't know if they knew about it now. But uh, uh, I'm not, not that because I'm not afraid of this, because I fully understand the vitamin C's power, because I've seen a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, preventive. I'm not going to uh, uh, into details, but uh, in our NIH presentation and other Facebook, YouTube, and uh, you know, we have covered a lot. But let me uh, suffice to say, there's enough evidence to show vitamin C can prevent us from catching viral infection. COVID-19 is no different, okay? And also, I know 
when doses are high enough, uh, uh, vitamin C can cure the virus and also can prevent us from developing disease or uh, from progressing to more severe diseases. So when I proposed that, I had only two commissions. I said, number one, if you allow me to go to the epicenter, I have to be able to use high dose vitamin C as I see fit. Uh, otherwise, I don't see any special position for me, right? I'm not going to intubate a patient. I haven't done that in a long time. I used to do a lot, you know. And number two, I am prepared because I have vitamin C at home. I am prepared, I was prepared to bring vitamin C with me. I'm going to receive daily dose of vitamin C every day in prevention. Yes, it's very safe. Let me tell you, I gave my parents in the 80s weekly dose of 20 grams of vitamin C. My parents are very healthy. I was, there are some chronic issues, right, at the age group. And so I give them for anti-aging. Uh, we're not going to talk uh, too much today. <laughs> but uh, so I'm showing you how safe it is. My parents receive 20 grams of vitamin C every day. Worldwide, many doctors do that, OK? And I receive that too, 20 grams, not every week, but once a while, OK? So I know I'm equipped. If I, even if I were to go, I know I'm able to beat that virus. I'm that confident. I heard that NIH invited you to make a speech. Well, it's, it's a great honor. You know, let me tell you a little bit about NIH. National Institu Institutes of Health is the highest uh, medical research, uh, uh, in, uh, author, uh, highest medical uh, research institution of the United States government. Uh, most of the research grants from the United States government in medical research go through NIH. So NIH represents the highest uh, level of uh, uh, academic medicine research. And uh, I was very honored to be uh, invited as one of the first speakers in the first session of a guest speaker series. Uh, they, they once a while on a particular topic, they were organized and uh, invited towards, towards uh, experts to talk on a specific uh, project. And I was the first one to talk about it. I'm very honored to do that. Yes. And uh, so um, in that conference, I reviewed again the existing, you know, again, re I reviewed the existing research, both in basic and in clinical science. This is pure fact finding, uh, not very much opinion. It's all, you know, presentation. And uh, that whole uh, presenting is available online and uh, we can refer to. And actually, let me also add a little bit, is that uh, because of this invitation, after the invitation, actually, it caused a little bit more wide world uh, interest. Even people from the United States government, I received the email from the Assistant Secretary to the uh, Health and uh, Human Resources Department uh, requesting my uh, PPT and information. So I know some people in the government uh, receive the attention, I mean, uh, are paying attention to this. I don't know if there's any policy or action coming out of it. I hope something will happen. We don't know yet. But that uh, presentation received the worldwide uh, attention. So it's helping, uh, probably, I hope, uh, also play, helping playing why they w we have uh, 12 clinical trials uh, going on right now. And uh, again, I'm encouraging people worldwide. Vitamin C is very safe. Enough evidence to show vitamin C is uh, effective and inexpensive. Feel free to try it. Many colleagues worldwide are using it in clinical tri uh, setting. Like I said, uh, 12 clinical trials already existing. And actually, in reality, there may be three times more of it. And also, we use in various clinical settings in directed in clinical treatment. So if your country, if your region is not doing it, you should do it. And uh, we actually very, let me add something here, is that I received an email from uh, UNICEF, which is a WHO uh, uh, United Nations organization. A UNICEF representative uh, in nutrition in Bangladesh sent me an email requesting my help uh, of uh, forming, uh, joining his team of uh, promoting to the local government to use high dose vitamin C. And uh, I'm glad I was of help and uh, it's ongoing, we don't know whether how the local government will respond, but UNICEF is also paying attention. I'm glad to hear that too. Okay, like for, I mean, the last question is for like, 
ordinary people like me, like the normal people, can we do something like help help others, like help more people to against with the virus, or can help you, like professor, do something? Yeah, thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Again, we the whole mankind are in the same boat. Okay, I can't think anybody is benefiting out of this. Whether you are in the government, whether you are in the pharmaceutical industry, uh, whether in the vaccine industry or medical science, we are all suffering from this. I heard many of the world's top uh, you know, leaders um, uh, have uh, caught this disease and are having problems. So yes, please, you can help yourself, you can help others by disseminating the, the, the information, you know, or the science, and also the clinical data, existing research. And also we have an online survey. This is a survey we designed with Dr. Zhang Hong and Dr. Chen Qi, I just mentioned, and myself, we designed to basically we want to see uh, the ordinary people who are taking vitamin C, how much you're taking, whether you're, co uh, you're catching any virus or code or even COVID-19, how you send the symptoms, basically gathering information. As you know, these are statistical analysis. The greater the number, the more powerful it is. And if you can, uh, again, on the website, we will show you the link to the form. And if we can f help you uh, fill out the form and also spreading to others, particularly people with COVID-19 infection, that will help us and also help you, help our future, help your children. To next time, hopefully, even when something like this happens, we can hit it, hit it hard with early and high dose vitamin C and others, we can do that, right? So this is a, a, a joint effort. And also, before I forget, let me mention a little bit, as ordinary people, hopefully you're lucky, you're, sa you're healthy at home. What can you do to prevent you from catching the disease, right? And also, if you catch a cold, for example, you're having a mild fever, you're afraid of going to hospital, what are you going to do? Let me tell you what I advise is ordinarily, a lot of things you can do, but uh, definitely one, a couple of things. One is take high dose vitamin C. I usually recommend a pure vitamin C powder, and uh, at least maybe at least two, three grams or more every day. I rec myself, I recommend five to 10 grams a day. You can divide it in several times, two times at least, maybe more, okay? And also, other than vitamin C, also vitamin D. Vitamin D, I recommend at least 5,000 units, international units a day. But uh, for the next couple of months, you know, during the peak of this uh, COVID-19, I would even go higher. I would advise you to go to 10,000, 20,000 international units uh, for two, three months. Believe me, it's very safe. Lots of research I'm not gonna talk today. Uh, we have websites you can refer to for the scientific resources. And uh, also magnesium. Magnesium is also a powerful uh, 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 nutrition no, uh, that also helps to uh, in the viral infection. Usually we recommend 500 or 1,000 milligrams a day. Uh, magnesium chloride may be even better or other magnesium uh, you know, glycine or this type of magnesium uh, uh, supplements. And zinc, uh, which, which play, we already know, zinc can help you to prevent the cold. And uh, the, uh, one of the drugs we talk a lot about, hydrochloroquine. Uh, actually, hydrochloroquine is the, itself doesn't seem to have a direct viral uh, infection. Its mechanism is proposed to be helping zinc to be internalized, basically helping the zinc to get into the cells to exert zinc's viral killing effect, okay? So hydrochloroquine chloroquine itself is not a, you know, direct drug itself. It helps zinc, so zinc is important. We recommend 50 to probably 100 milligram during this uh, COVID-19 season, you know, I mean, a couple of months. And ordinarily, we usually recommend maybe 30 to 50 mil, uh, milligrams a day for prevention of COVID. Okay, these are all common things you can use as prevention. On top of that, also others, for example, make sure you rest well and make sure you get well hydrated, drink water frequently, and sleep well and eat well. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail. Don't eat junk foods, right? And we know that. And now that's for healthy people and th there are other antioxidants you can use. But also, <coughs> what if you catch 
a cold. <coughs> Let's say you come down with a cold, <coughs> a little bit fever, a little bit of upper respiratory infection, or even urinary tract infection, which may or may not be COVID-19. What do you do? Well, other than the things I already talked about, you can definitely boost your vitamin D to 25,000 international units for a period of time. So you, you don't have to stay on it for a long time, right? A long time, usually we recommend maybe, maybe 5,000 units daily, and particularly in, in winter times, or maybe more, actually. But also vitamin C. I particularly recommend including, increasing vitamin C dosage. What we re re recommend is that when you catch any of these signs of infection, what I do is I recommend at least five grams of vitamin C right away, okay? The idea here is that you want to maximize the absorption of vitamin C. And uh, uh, usually we even recommend that to take enough vitamin C to reach so-called bowel tolerance, meaning the high enough dosage that right before you, uh, you have a diarrhea, okay? And then after this, you every hour in your waking hour, let's say every hour, you every day you have 16 hours you are awake, try to take a lot of vitamin C every hour. The idea here is that to maximize the absorption, okay? And uh, because at home you can do IV, right? Yeah. So you can take vitamin C every hour. Usually we say at least one gram, I mean, may, may do more. Again, what I, my recommendation is one gram per hour to the bowel tolerance. If one gram every hour doesn't have diarrhea and you still have symptom, increase. Two grams every hour. You still have symptom, not getting much better. And three grams, you can increase all the way until you have diarrhea. It's very safe. Here's one thing that we know long, long time ago about the, by a doctor, Robert Cascott, uh, which is a, who is a pioneer, is that, that actually when we are sick, our tolerance of vitamin C dramatically increases. The theory behind it is that when we are sick, we consume way too much vitamin C. So that's how you would use to treat. And of course, you can also use liposomal vitamin C, which uh, is worldwide available if you can get a hold of it, and you can take that. And uh, so finally, let me also like to mention, other than filling out the form, one thing I really want to mention about uh, early on, I talk about the vaccine and also the disturbing increasing trend of, uh, of uh, epidemic, epidemics and pandemics, is that we said, uh, the epidemic, epidemics uh, appears to be on the rise. And uh, every year this century, we see an average of about six or more epidemics a year. And epidemics will hit us again, guaranteed, just a matter of uh, a time. And so next time, hopefully, uh, did we talk about vitamins, uh, va vaccine development? Vaccine is in reaction to a new appearing virus. So. We, uh, you know, this time, for example, COVID-19. COVID-19, there's been only a short, I think we covered this, right? There's only been a short four months where it already caused a lot of people, uh, a lot of deaths and a lot of financial damage. So vaccine is in reaction. Hopefully in the future, while we are waiting for vaccine, we should take active measures. I think we're talking about this too. Is that, uh, you know, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, uh, 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 magnesium and the uh, living, sleeping well regularly and diet, all these integrative measures. These are powerful, proactive measures that can help us to build up a defense uh, to uh, help reduce our risk of catching diseases, catching these epidemics, but also if we catch the disease that, help, that can help us to uh, reduce the severity and uh, help us to uh, preventing us from progressing to more severe diseases. So we can use it now, in the middle of the COVID-19, and also we can use it in the future when another major epidemic pandemic hits us. And that's a very important message, hope we, we can all learn about it. And I thank you very much for your attention. And finally, let's make a conclusion. Then, you know, I really want to know some suggestion for like, if we, if next time the virus coming, so what's the suggestion for like government, people, uh, like, like everyone? Yes, actually, you know, uh, when, when the COVID-19 became a serious in the United States and the United States Congress authorized, uh, I think it was 8.1 billion US dollars. That's the first 
a batch for COVID-19. And of, out of which 3.7 billion, which is uh, 3.1 billion about, is 37% of the total uh, uh, authorization was allotted, uh, allocated for vaccine development, mm -hmm. which is important. But again, we understand vaccine won't be here for at least another year. So for example, I wish, I, I wish the US government or the other governments would spend more money on like a Wuhan government, acquiring, buying more vitamin C, giving to people. I heard, I don't know, I couldn't, con I didn't confirm, in Philippines or, or I think it was the Philippines, they were giving vitamin C to school children for free. Yeah. And that this is kind of like uh, things I like to see, is that, uh, you know, worldwide government, I hope we pay more attention to uh, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, magnesium, the things we're talking about. And also for those high risk, in particularly high risk, high risk group of people, for example, healthcare providers, people who take care of these sick patients, and also senior patients, patients with, uh, uh, you know, uh, chronic diseases or immunocompromised, the hospitalized patients, we should give them a lot of vitamin C, helping them to prevent and uh, catching the disease while we also focus on vitamin vaccine. We need to have a, you know, right now all, we, all I hear is a vaccine, you know. Vaccine, again, like I said, is, use, uh, is good, but mostly for preventing recurrent uh, uh, ep uh, epidemics, not for the first time. Like uh, right now, COVID-19, we don't have a vaccine. I wish we had a vaccine four months ago, we don't. And uh, so, Vaccines pure, definitely is not a complete solution to the problem. It's part of the solution. And uh, early on, during any new epidemic, uh, more importantly is probably other measures, not vaccine. Mm. Clearly, because of the nature of the RMD of vaccine. And that's hopefully is my concluding uh, remark. Okay, thank you for coming today. Thanks.